Hi, I'm Rebecca Balcarcel. Let's look at The Fish, a poem by Elizabeth Bishop. Bishop is one of the big names in the 20th century world of poetry, and this poem in particular is assigned a lot in college classes. It's known for its imagery, that is, for the visual representation of the fish. We can see this fish very, very well, very clearly and in great detail. And you'll see how Elizabeth Bishop manages to not only paint the picture of the outer fish, but gives a sense of the spirit of the fish and celebrates that spirit. Let's get started. The fish. I caught a tremendous fish. That means that it's big and kind of awe-inspiring. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat. Listen to the bees. Beside the boat. Half out of water with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. Fast means tight. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight. Can you hear hung, grunting? Sound The U sounds. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable. Now, battered, we understand. It seems like he's been through a lot. Venerable means worthy of veneration, which is almost like adoration, near worship even. We venerate wise people. Uh, we venerate saints. So veneration is a word that conveys a lot of respect and honor. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable, and homely, which means not pretty, <laughs> almost ugly. Here and there his brown skin hung in strips, like ancient wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, two or three rags of green weed hung down. Now we get a sharp visual here of this fish. He's not a pretty fish. In fact, his skin is hanging in strips. And if you haven't seen wallpaper that's coming off, it tends to strip off uh, in little sh shreds that are long kind of threads and strips. And the skin looks like wallpaper. And the wallpaper seems to have a this pattern of the roses, full-blown roses. But this is paper that has seen better days. It's kind of faded now, and she says that he's covered with little barnacles and lice, so you can tell he's pulled out of a place where there's a lot of life going on, and little parasites are on the body. Rags of green weed, that's uh, comparing the strips or strings of, of seaweed hanging down, they look like rags, like little towels, you know, hanging down. And moving on. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, because of course for a fish, he can't breathe out in the air. And you notice that we are dilating a very small moment in time, just like your eye dilates to let in more light. This poem dilates the f moment of seeing the fish. So we are letting in all the details of this fish. And what would have only taken seconds in real life is taking this whole page and a half or more of the poem to describe. So what she was able to notice in an instant, it takes longer to write it all out and list everything and show all of these careful observations. But that's good because we can experience it with her this way. We can really see this fish for ourselves. So the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood, that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers. And if you've ever eaten fish, you know that some of the flesh looks kind of like feathers packed together. Packed in like feathers. The big bones and the little bonies. The dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails. So that's, you know, his guts, you might say, all the intestinal stuff and the pink swim bladder, like a big peony. That's a flower that's quite large with its blossoms. 
a peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil, seen through the lenses of old scratched eyes and glass. Some wonderful sound play here, backed, packed, tarnished tinfoil. We have repeated sounds here. And notice how she sees the eye seeing her, but this fish eye is shallower. It doesn't have that depth that the human eye has when we look at a human eye. Um, and she's seeing that the iris, which is the colored part, it seems like it that behind that is tarnished tinfoil. So it's kind of a metallic uh, sheen to it, sort of sparkling. And then she says it's as if you're looking at it through Isinglass. Now, Isinglass is an old form of kind of like plastic sheet <laughs> because uh, on a, a horse and buggy, you know, in a carriage, they could roll down Isinglass curtains, but they were clear so you could see through them, but not very well because this is not a, a technology that would allow for crystal clear, uh, you know, light to trans go through it very easily. It was kind of, you know, sort of like a dirty window and kind of plasticky, so it's as if you're looking through plastic, the eyes and glass. Um, so it's as if you're looking through that to see this, the iris in the fish eye. They shifted a little, the eyes, but not to return my stare. So the fish is not trying to look at her. The fish does not think about her, the fisher woman, or, or it could be a fisher man. We're kind of assuming it's a woman because the poet is a woman, but it could be a man. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. So his eye just sort of t tilted and, and tipped. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw, there's some rhyme there, jaw saw, that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. All right, so we're seeing that this fish has been hooked before, five times at least, because the hooks are, are grown into the mouth. So this happened long enough ago that his body has been able to grow the lip around the hooks, you know. Um, so now they're just part of him. And she says, I admired his face. So remember that word at the beginning, venerable? Now we have the word admired. So both of those convey this honor that she is giving to the fish, this respect she has for the fish. And notice how she's aware of the mechanism of his jaw. So it's not just looking at the jaw, but seeing how the jaw works and how it's different than her own jaw. She's a careful observer. All right, so we see these five hooks, and they have the wire leaders attached. So those of you who know something about fishing, you know what a wheat leader is and, and the wire and the hook and how that all goes together. But even if you don't know about fishing, it's, it's the fish line there that's hanging down. A green line frayed at the end and crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons, frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. So the, the hooks are metal, but she's saying these are like medals, as in medals like you would wear uh, on an army uniform or a you know, any kind of military uniform where there's a, some kind of metal and then there's some ribbon. She compares the hooks with their lines to these medals with their ribbons. So a medal is something you get for bravery, for extraordinary service of some kind. They are rewarding your honorable behavior or your brave behavior. So here's another uh, sign that this fisherwoman, fisherman, is thinking of the fish as an honored being, 
not just another fish, but a special fish, a fish that has his medals with their ribbons. The fact that he's old and has survived all of these catchings is part of the respect there, like part of her motivation for regarding this fish with so much respect. And I think there's more to it than just his age. Um, the fact that he's been caught and got away means that he's extremely strong or wily or smart or somehow he was able to get away five times. So those qualities are maybe what these medals would be for, rewarding him for those qualities. Um, I love the strain and snap. We have a lot of good sounds in this poem. S.S. I stared and stared and victory filled up the little rented boat. So she's rented a boat to come out and fish, and now she has caught this fish that everybody else was unable to catch, right? These five other hooks were unsuccessful catches. And so she feels like, hey, I have triumphed. I have caught the fish that no one else could catch. So that's the victory, filling up the boat. From the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine, to the baler, rusted orange, the sun-cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, and this is a big list of the items in the boat, right? The parts of the boat. And if you, again, know about boats, then all of these terms are, are very clear to you what they are. But even if you don't know the parts of the boat, you can see that she knows her stuff. These specific words, these, this jargon, lends a lot of credibility to the poem. Uh, she understands the parts of the boat, and it makes the poem more crunchy, more, more chewable, right? Because we can imagine these specific things. It's not just generally described, oh, the boat, you know, that end of the boat. No, she uses the real terminology, and it makes it more authentic. So... The oil had spread from the motor, right, around the engine, the baler, the thwarts, the oarlocks, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And I let the fish go. Okay, so the surprise ending is that she lets the fish go. And this rainbow, rainbow, rainbow is so enthusiastic, so triumphant. But... Besides just being triumphant that she caught this fish who had eluded other fishermen, there's also a feeling of um, communion with nature, a feeling of being in the presence of a, an animal who has been through a lot, who has suffered, who has an aching jaw, but who is experienced and has seen a lot of life. So her communion with this creature her connection to the creature starts to be part of that feeling, I think, that's expressed with the words rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And she repeats it three times to show how big a feeling this is, how moved she is, how expanded she feels. Rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. It's overwhelming. It's beautiful. And she let the fish go. And we can see why. Because she uses words like venerable, wisdom, metals, she has great respect for this fish by now and what he's been through. He's a warrior and she honors that. And even though she did catch him, it just wouldn't be right, in, you know, apparently, you know, to, to go ahead and make this his last moments on earth. She wants to let the fish go. And it's not just a, uh, some sort of, um, ecological sense on her part or uh, animal rights. It seems like she went fishing to go fishing. Uh, she was going to catch a fish. But this fish, she admired it so much. She observed it so carefully. She built a relationship with the fish. And now it's only right that she celebrate his life instead of ending it. And his special history shown by the hooks and the lines hanging from his jaw uh, is part of why. But also, even the way his jaw works, the way his eye tilts, she's observing it so carefully that 
this has changed her relationship with the fish. It's not just a fish. It's a, a thing of beauty and a thing to revere, to have reverence for. And so she lets the fish go. Well, this is one of my favorite poems, and I hope you enjoyed visiting it with me. And join me for another video sometime.